All right. It, it's 12.01, so I'm going to go ahead and get going. We have a few things to cover before we get into the actual uh, Lunch and Learn. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to our third Lunch and Learn webinar for 2022. Everyone should be muted as you join, and I just ask that you remain on mute until the presentation is over when I can open it up and we can have some questions and answers and dialogue with our presenter. There's also a Q&A function and a chat, which I'll keep an eye on. So please feel free to type in any questions or comments as we go along. This session is being recorded and the link to the recording and the slide deck will be provided early next week to everyone who signed up. So thanks for joining us to learn about a hopeful new technology for removing PFAS from wastewater and a few other things as well. Um, I first heard about foam fractionation uh, from CDM Smith in a report that they did for Nebra, WEF, and NACWA titled Cost Analysis and Impacts on Municipal Utilities and Biosolids Management to Address PFAS Contamination, uh, which is available on our Nebra website from the main page currently. Um, then I bumped into a superintendent, the superintendent of the Anson Madison Treatment Facility from Maine at our annual residuals conference, who told me he was working on a foam fractionation pilot. And then I met Steve Woodward from ECT2 at the annual NUIA conference, and he's been working on this pilot project and looking at other innovative technologies that deal with PFAS. So I invited him here to present today at our Lunch and Learn, because I knew a lot of NEBRA members would be interested in this, this topic as well. So I'm pleased to introduce Steve Wood Woodard here today with us. He's the president and co-founder of ECT2, that stands for Emerging Compounds Treatment Technologies. ECT2 is an equipment company focused on developing and commercializing treatment technologies for emerging and difficult to treat contaminants. His responsibilities include leading research and new product development, providing technical leadership on all projects, uh, proposal development, intellectual property, that must be like patents and stuff, Yuck. And yeah. uh, communication yeah. with the engineering and remediation community. So Steve's focus is currently on commercializing synthetic media technology for the sustainable treatment of PFAS, 1,4-dioxane, and other emerging contaminants. He has a PhD in environmental engineering from Purdue University. And with that, I'll ask Steve to turn on his uh, screen share. Share his screen. And you can take it away. Steve. Okay, let's just pull it up here. All right. And try presentation mode. Are you are you seeing? Very good. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you for the uh, the nice intro, Janine. I am um, appreciative of uh, being able to talk about some new tech, couple of new technologies here, both. Um, uh, PFAS related, and uh, the plan here is to spend roughly 40 minutes um, of, um, and I guess, Jenny, a good question for you, is it okay to have people ask questions along the way, or do we want to hold the questions? Um, that would be entirely up to you, Steve. Uh, okay. You, you may see the questions in the corner of your screen, and yeah, feel free to answer them at that time if you want. Okay. Okay. If I see them, I'll answer them. If not, we'll, we'll get them at the end. Exactly. Okay, great. So uh, here, here's the outline. And um, I think a lot of people are, are starting to hear about foam fractionation. Um, and um, it's probably worth spending a few minutes talking about how, uh, how it works to remove PFAS from water. What, what are the mechanisms? And <clears throat> always good to understand the the advantages of the, the technology and you know where it applies um i'll show some some bench and pilot testing photos videos data <clears throat> a, a quick full-scale example and um talk a little bit about short chain removal of pfas using foam fractionation and then of course you have residuals um the waste stream is, is fomate and uh, there are a number of innovative PFAS destruction technologies 
um, that are at various stages of development and commercialization. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of those, how they work and, and provide some examples. So most PFAS compounds are surfactants. And so what does that mean? <clears throat> if you look over on the top left, that's uh, my, my crude representation of uh, PFOS molecule. And so PFOS has like, like most PFAS compounds ha has this fluorinated carbon tail on the left here, which um, is very hydrophobic, right? It does not fit well in the polar water matrix. <clears throat> and over on the right, the right-hand side of the compound is a, um, a charged uh, portion of the compound. And in this case, it's a sulfonate um, anion. And so two distinctly different groups, that, that hydrophobic, you know, water hating fluorinated carbon tail, and then the hydrophilic charged water loving um, hydrophilic head. And so if we look at how <laughs> these, um, these compounds, which are surfactants, line up around an air bubble, well, these, these hydrophobic tails that don't like water tend to line up inside the air bubble. And then the, the negatively charged heads tend to be associated with the water. And so what that does is it, it reduces surface tension and causes foaming. And so if you look at the photo over on the right, it's a, it's a plane crash that is being coated with um, AFFF foam. <clears throat> and the reason they do that is, is really at least twofold. One, um, since these compounds love to foam, that foam can smother the fire or, or the spilled fuel and prevent oxygen from, from um, getting to the fuel and, and hence smothers the fire. So the other thing is the compounds are, are really heavily recalcitrant. So that, that fluorine carbon bond, the, the bonds in the tail, um, hydrophobic tail of the compound are um, very recalcitrant, difficult to break down, some of the strongest bonds known in, in nature. So stands to reason, right? Put out a fire because it smothers the fire and the compounds don't, they don't oxidize. They, they just stay in their recalcitrant uh, original form. So <clears throat> if we focus then on um, how, how does Foam, fractional, foam fractionation technology work. How does it remove PFAS from water? It's a fairly simplified drawing, but, but the take home message here is that the dirty water, whether it's wastewater, leachate, groundwater, whatever, enters at the top of the reactor and flows down. In the meantime, bubbles and air bubbles and turbulence are being generated at the bottom and they're flowing up. So as the dirty water flows down, it tends to, um, the PFAS compounds tend to get tied up with the air bubbles and become part of the foam, which rises of course, because it's lighter than water. And then that foam forms a concentrated layer of um, heavily PFAS um, contaminated. And, and, that, and that's how the PFAS is removed from the water, right? You have, you have PFAS contaminated water coming in, flowing down, countercurrent to the flow of air bubbles and turbulence that are rising. They grab onto the PFAS compounds. They thicken as they rise to the, the surface. And then you have thickened um, foam, which can then be skimmed off. And, and so if we go to the next slide, it's, um, this is actually from a patent application that we filed and it, it shows a little bit more detail. And so um, 
Janine, is, is are you seeing my um, cursor as I'm moving around? Yes, I am. Okay, that's good. That's helpful. So again, we have the contaminated water, contaminated with PFAS, flowing into the top of the reactor, and then down flowing through the reactor. At the same time, we have air, which is introduced through a Venturi, um, Venturi device, which um, creates air and turbulence, and therefore bubbles, which travel down through this pipe, out into a diffuser, which creates swirling and bubbles. And as those bubbles rise, they create foam, they pick up the PFAS compounds. And again, those PFAS compounds concentrate in the form of foam at the top and can be either skimmed off or vacuumed off. <clears throat> but meanwhile, the water as it travels, the contaminated water as it travels through the reactor um, becomes stripped of the PFAS, cleaned, and then it flows out through the bottom of the reactor and then up through a standpipe, which can be adjusted through a valve or, or, or an adjustment of height. And, and basically what that does, is it controls the level in the reactor, which is part of the, you know, think about what are the knobs that you have to turn, right? Well, it's the, the flow rate coming in, helps dictate the, the hydraulic resonance time within the, uh, the foam fractionator. The <clears throat> recycle flow is gonna dictate a few things, including the amount of air that's pulled in through the uh, Venturi adductor, right? The, um, the diffuser and this baffle can be adjusted to help minimize <clears throat> the amount of PFAS that ultimately make it out into the, uh, the treated effluent. And then, like I said, the height or the flow by using this valve can be adjusted to, um, you know, the, Think about it like the, the higher the water level in the reactor, the more foam is going to flow, the wetter the foam is going to be. As we reduce that level, the foam has to work harder to get up and it's going to be a drier foam. And um, it, it, it uh, will produce less foam, more concentrated foam. If we look over here on the right, what are the handling options? So we have the PFAS that's concentrated in the foam. Well, it can either flow up um, using the, the buoyancy principle, or we can have a longer neck, if you will, up here and use vacuum to pull the foam out of the reactor. And in doing so, a lot of the water drips back down. So you, you end up drying the foam, create less of it and more concentrated. Um, this, this foam ultimately needs to be converted back to a liquid to do something with it. And so that can be done in a variety of ways, um, some of which are, are trade secrets and, and intellectual property. Um, the foam can also be sent to a subsequent foam fractionation reactor to um, co further concentrate the foam, reduce the volume, increase the concentration of PFAS um, so that any or a combination of these can be used to then turn the foam into a more concentrated liquid, which then um, can be treated with resin or carbon or some other technology, such as on-site destruction. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. So what are the advantages of foam fractionation? If you look at this photo on the right, that's a full-scale uh, fractionator that we installed, our company um, ECT2, installed uh, up in the northern reaches of Australia at uh, RAF Base Tyndall, which is Royal Australian Air Force Base Tyndall. And um, not to be confused with the Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. but a big advantage of these reactors is that the treatment is agnostic to levels of total, total dissolved, sorry, total dissolved solids, TDS, 
NOM, which is natural organic matter, right? And that comes in handy because if you're going to then, uh, instead of using foam fractionation, try to treat the waste using carbon or ion exchange resin, one of the more traditional technologies, things like um, inorganic anions, which contribute to TDS, um, natural organic matter, which contributes to TOC, these can, can really um, impact the, adversely impact, impact the capacity of the carbon or the resin. And so it reduces the effectiveness, the efficiency, and can cause fouling. And so um, when you have a, a water that you're trying to clean up that has a lot of competing anions or other fouling agents, foam fractionation can be a really good choice. Um, and another advantage is that it's very simple operation, right? It's uh, basically pumping and bubbling in air um, and maybe using a vacuum. So there are very few moving parts. There's nothing to clog or build up. There's no media in there. Um, it's just pretty wide open. And as a result, um, since it's, it doesn't build pressure, the energy use tends to be low. <clears throat> the operating expense as a result tends to be quite low. And really where it works best, like what, what are the applications that are most um, commonly going to um, be applied to foam fractionation? And it really tends to be the, the difficult waters, the, the, um, the really challenging waters that have <clears throat> things like very high TDS or high levels of natural organic matter or adhesives or other things that could foul, you know, solids, things that can that could foul other traditional or more traditional PFAS treatment systems. Um, and it can also be a very effective pretreatment step for some of these difficult to treat waters like landfill leachate, right? Which has a ton of inorganic anions like chloride and sulfate. <clears throat> nitrate and um, also has a lot of iron and TOC, NOM. Industrial wastewater, depending on the source, can also be quite, quite nasty and have a lot of fouling agents and other contaminants that compete for capacity on the resin. Um, you could have groundwater hotspots that might've been created by um, fire training in areas at airports or air force bases or refineries or, or the like. And those high concentrations, it may make economic sense to take, um, you know, bite the head off the snake and, and remove those highest concentrations up front using a simpler technology, a less expensive technology like foam fractionation. And, you know, other high concentration streams can also be, um, used or, or, or applied to foam fractionation to, um, to clean up the PFAS, remove PFAS um, in ways that are not adversely affected by um, elevated levels of, um, of phalanx. Okay, so this is a, a recent a pilot test that, that took place at Anson Madison, uh, which is up in Maine. And it's a lagoon system, former paper mill that's since been shut down. And over on the left, you can see a photo of that uh, foam fractionation reactor where the, um, <clears throat> the contaminated water is coming in at the top. The uh, treated water is coming out at the bottom. Uh, air bubbles and turbulence are being introduced to whip this um, into a froth and help grab onto the PFAS molecules, incorporate them into the foam, and then thicken the foam as it flows up into the, uh, into the collection ring, where now <clears throat> it will be collected and turned back into a liquid, liquid for further treatment or, um, or destruction, right? And so over on the right, we have some data from this 
um, this pilot test, which was performed a few months back. And if we focus on the blue line for a minute, so this is percent removal. And on the blue axis, that's percent removal of PFOS plus PFOA, right? And so it, this also corresponds to no foam boosting or enhancing um, reagent addition. So this is just straight um, wastewater that has been treated, partially treated by lagoon system. And you can see the difference here between the uh, HRT and the reactor. So what does that mean? <clears throat> For on the x-axis 10, this means that the flow is adjusted so that we had an average 10 minute HRT in the reactor. As we increase that dwell time to 15 minutes, the um, percent removal of PFOS plus PFOA increased from roughly 81% to about a little over 85%. And then another five minutes added onto that reaction time took us up to um, almost 90%, right? If we look over on the right axis, so that's the, um, the sum of those compounds in, in parts per trillion. And so again, as the HRT increases, the quantity or, or the mass or the concentration of PFOS and or PFOA is, is going to decrease. And so this, this dotted horizontal line represents the, um, the limit at, at uh, let's see, at seven, yeah, this, this is at 70 um, parts per trillion for PFOS plus PFOA. And that was the limit at the time that was being placed uh, on the discharge of um, treated PFAS. So basically what we're trying to do in this test is figure out if we were to just take the lagoon effluent and run it through a foam fractionation reactor like this, albeit this is a pilot reactor, can we consistently achieve um, compliance with the discharge standard, which at this facility is 70 uh, PFOS plus PFOA? So the answer is yes. And you can also see that the increasing hydraulic retention time um, helps that enhance treatment. So if we look down at the, the plot down at the bottom, um, we have three different curves. And this is the um, amount of water that came in that was, that was um, converted to foam and on, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, again, we have PFOS plus PFOA removal. And so <clears throat> number one was with no, the addition of no added surfactant to help the foaming, right? And so the um, removal decreased a little bit as we produced um, more foam. So in other words, the nice thing is you can run this and convert only 2% of the influent flow, the flow coming into this reactor, into foam and get very good removal. Um, and then if we add two different uh, boosting agents, which I've blocked off here because they're at the, at the moment proprietary, um, things that we've developed in the lab. Uh, so one of the foam boosting agents got up, up to about 97% removal at, at a low foam production. And then, you know, right around 95% removal. S same for this, this foam boosting agent here. So all this tells us is that typically increasing the dwell time or the reaction time helps remove more PFAS. Um, producing less foam, so drier foam, which has a number of advantages, is, is better. And adding that boosting agent, which is just a supplemental surfactant, also helps um, considerably. And the purpose of this slide is to just show that um, there's a lot of development taking place, R&D, <clears throat> to enhance the ability of these foam fractionators to remove PFAS from water. And um, this is some of the 
intellectual property that we've we filed for patent protection. I've, that's why I've blocked it out here. But um, yeah, it's 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 things like adjusting the diffuser and the baffle and the way that water is introduced into uh, into the foam fractionator in a tangential arrangement as opposed to um, shooting the bubble straight up or, or some other um, variation. So here's a, um, a bench test that was done a few months back. It's a confidential client. And um, they tested uh, the following. This, this is industrial wastewater. They tested it without any supplemental surfactant addition. Um, and then they also tested it with the addition of FF's, FF Boost 1, which is one of our um, foam boosting agents. And some interesting data here. If you look down at um, what are the contaminants, uh, and, and by the way, these units are in PPT. So you have PMPA, which is a four carbon chain uh, PFAS compound. PFOA, which most of you have heard about, it's the eight carbon chain. We had a couple of uh, polyfluorinated compounds, which tend to foam less and are, are typically more difficult to remove. And then a shorter chain compound, um, PFHXA. And so here are the influent values in, in nanograms per liter. And then these are the results in this, um, this row here of the raffinate, which is the treated water, and the foamate is the, is the reject foam that comes off the top, right? So the, the raffinate, you can see the, um, the removals ranged, you know, anywhere from, um, and not all the data are shown here, but <clears throat> from 11 to 86. Uh, the lowest you see here is, is, is 21. And then if you look at after we added this, this uh, supplemental surfactant to help create more foam and thereby help remove more surfactants, the results improved significantly from 64% to 99%, 86 to 92, 87 to 98, 21 to 99, and 30 to 97%. So pretty clear that adding supplemental surfactant can have a, a pretty substantial a beneficial impact on, on PFAS removal efficiency. And I have a video here that I'm gonna show you, which shows, this is a, a bench scale foam fractionator. This is where the, the bubbling and the turbulence, the, the influent flow is downflow, the um, aerated water with lots of turbulence here at the diffuser is upflow, it whips the wastewater into a froth. The foam is collected up at the top, thickened, and then discharged. So let's watch the video. All right, so this had a little bit of the, the FF boost added because um, we were having, uh, as you can see, a, a little trouble getting to the, to the treatment requirements that we were shooting for. But that, uh, that little bit of, um, of boost agent really did the trick. And there's nothing like seeing it uh, in a video. All right, so this was actually, um, a, an industrial waste treatment facility that was accepting leachate and oily waste. And there's a lot of data here. I don't expect you to digest all of it. But as we, as we went across, so here, here are PFAS compounds here, um, carboxylates, sulfonates, and other. Something and, went wrong. Please try again. 
All right, there's my phone talking at me. <laughs> and um, so as we go across, the, um, the dwell time increased from um, two minutes to five minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes. And then in the final column, we used a boosting agent. And the whole point of this slide is that for some very difficult water, we can achieve some really high PFAS removal efficiencies, you know, on the order of, you know, 98, 97, 99%, even on some short chains, right? It's not always easy to get PFBA out. Sometimes you're lucky to get 30% out. But in this case, we removed 99% of it. PFPA was um, also um, well removed, PFHXA, HPA, PFOA, and then down here, PFBS, uh, PFHXS, you know, some really high removal. So once you dial in the operation of that foam fractionator, <clears throat> it is possible to have some, some um, experience, some, some fairly impressive removals of PFAS. Uh, now moving on to, here's a design of one of our pilot systems. Uh, it ha actually has two foam fractionators. They can be operated in parallel, parallel series. One of the things that you can do is, is, is harvest the foam from the top and then uh, treat that in a second reactor, which further thickens, concentrates the foam. Over here, we have columns of carbon and resin to treat that foamate. Um, and or the raffinate, which is the, the clean water. If it's not meeting standard, you can also, um, it's gonna be, quality is gonna be much improved, but you can add um, foam fractionation, at, at, or sorry, um, you can add uh, carbon or resin at the end to polish it. Here's the build out of that design that you saw for a, for a mobile pilot system, which this system is down in, um, Alabama right now, working at an industrial manufacturing facility that, um, that generates um, PFAS related products. And so concentrations are high and uh, foam fractionation is, is a really good application because the chloride levels are, are really high. And if you're trying to treat this water with straight uh, ion exchange resin, that um, the chloride levels would severely reduce the capacity of the resin to remove uh, PFAS from water. And so um, pre-treating up front with foam fractionation is a really good uh, application because it's, like I said, it's agnostic to those high <coughs> chloride levels, high TDS. Here's what a full-scale system looks like. You can see the in this case, nasty looking foam, concentrating uh, and collecting at the top. Um, over here, you see the dirty water coming in, flowing down to the bottom. As it gets down to the bottom, it's clean because the PFAS has been stripped, carried up to the top. And now here's your standpipe where that um, clean raffinate is then flowing off site. Okay, so what do you do with the, the, the foamate? We can either concentrate it onto carbon or resin, um, or we could destroy, better yet, we could destroy it, right? And so what are some of the destruction technologies that are under, under development right now? There's various types of plasma technologies, electrochemical oxidation, supercritical water oxidation, halt process, hydrothermal alkaline treatment, uh, micelle assisted photocatalytic reduction, electron beam, advanced oxidation, synolysis, UV sulfite, zero valent iron, alkali metal reduction, biodegradation, which is um, is not enjoying a, a, a ton of success. It's it, these, these compounds are very difficult to break down, and uh, and the microbes, the bugs, don't have a ton of success breaking them down. But there's been a lot of progress on these on-site PFAS destruction technologies over the last five years because incineration is falling out of favor and now landfilling is also falling out of favor with certain entities like 
<clears throat> like the, the Navy and other branches of defense. And so to make these PFAS destruction technologies practical, the first step is, is to separate PFAS from the water. The second step is to concentrate because we want to treat a low volume, um, high concentration stream of, of PFAS to make these, um, these destruction technologies practical. They are not practical at high flow or high volume, low PFAS concentration. So the whole idea is to reduce that liquid volume that needs to be treated, increase concentration of PFAS. And those options to do that <clears throat> include membrane treatment, regenerable ion exchange resin treatment, and foam fractionation. And so the separate, concentrate, destroy provides the complete PFAS treatment that we ideally would like to use to minimize liability of, of waste being transported offsite. A little bit on uh, plasma technology. Um, there are a bunch of different kinds, uh, but they use ionized gas to destroy PFAS by promoting powerful reduction, in other words, aqueous electrons and oxidation reactions. Uh, this technology is emerging as one of the most promising for PFAS destruction. And we have worked, our technology, ECT2, that Regenerable Resin has, has um, joined forces with um, a couple of different plasma destruction technologies to demonstrate greater than 99% uh, destruction of, of all PFAS at, at multiple sites. So <clears throat> this is getting ready for prime time for, for commercialization. Um, Clarkson University and, and their uh, DMAX associate have developed the electrical discharge plasma and they've come quite a way. OnVector is making really good progress. They have a plasma vortex technology. Uh, InNTEC in collaboration with MIT has a plasma melter. Uh, Drexel and University of Mich Michigan have cold plasma technologies. Over on the right, you see what one of these reactors looks like. And down below, you see one of the, the uh, Clarkson mobile trailers that's used. Electrochemical oxidation, that um, uses direct, uh, direct electron transfer at the anode and um, also indirect oxidative species generation. And these bust apart those, um, these PFAS molecules. And again, like plasma, it's emerging as a very successful technology. We have collaborated with AECOM and University of Georgia on their defluoro process and have had um, a very recent a successful demonstration at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base showing that we can um, concentrate with, with our technology and destroy with ACOM slash U Georgia's technology on site. Fraunhofer, <clears throat> they're out of Michigan. They use boron doped, um, diamond electrodes and um, have also experienced some, some good destruction of both short and long chains. And Aclarity is a Massachusetts company that uh, relatively new, but starting to demonstrate some uh, success on destruction of some of the, the uh, long chain compounds. Here's a, a couple of plots to show that um, electrochemical oxidation can can uh, destroy the, the full suite of, of compounds. You can see that it, it takes a bit of time, um, up to two hours, and that's why you don't want a high flow, low concentration stream. You wanna have low flow, high concentration, like foamate from foam fractionation or um, a spent still bottoms from a um, regenerable resin application. But uh, it's a pretty, impressive results there from our work at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Hall process, hydrothermal alkaline treatment, it uses, uh, it's not super critical, so it's not, um, not uh, excessively high temperature and pressure, but they do use elevated temperature pressure 
and caustic addition to increase the pH. Nucleophilic substitution is the uh, active mechanism. And um, this process is very exciting in that it has demonstrated complete mineralization of PFAS, including the short chains. And in fact, it, unlike most of these technologies, which, which break down the longer chains to shorter chains, <clears throat> and in some cases, in fact, let me go back up one slide. If you look here, the PFBA actually increases in concentration at first. And that's because some of these longer chains are breaking down and forming PFBA. And then um, the PFBA is the last to be removed. Well, the Hall process actually does, uh, let me just go back a little bit here. Um, and this is um, a collaboration of Aquaga, which is a startup company and the Colorado School of Mines um, have, have demonstrated, if you look over on the right, some complete uh, defluorination of these compounds. This plot shows um, destruction. Again, we're talking about hours here, not minutes, but this plot shows uh, destruction of um, long chains as well as short chains. That, that's the complete mineralization I was talking about. All right, getting ready to wrap it up here. I think this is my last slide. So my cell assisted photoactivated reductive defluorination is relatively new technology. It, it's similar to the UV sulfite technology, which is reductive. Um, but by adding, adding um, surfactants and forming a, a micelle reactive cage, this accelerates the reaction rate. Um, accelerates the breakdown of PFAS and um, the inspired solutions who, who are commercializing the technology are claiming that uh, the reaction rate has increased up to 40 times compared to competing technologies and the energy use is not that high. So this is one to keep an eye on. So, so that's the presentation. Um, hopefully I've covered the topic of, of foam fractionation for PFAS removal um, in, in some level of depth that gives you an idea of how it works, um, where it's applicable, what you end up with residuals and what you do with those residuals in addition to uh, a little bit of a focus on the destruction um, of the foamate which is the, the primary residual um, during foam fractionation. So with that, um, I'm gonna look at the chats here and see, see what we have for questions. Whoops, <laughs> I just lost it. I don't know um, if, uh, Jeannie, if you can maybe read the questions off to me, it might be easier. Sure, all right. So here's the first one. Um, would this technology better treat the influent of a wastewater treatment facility or the effluent? It's a good question. And um, of course the answer is that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, in a lot of cases, it's gonna be used up front for pretreatment. Um, to, uh, I, I give you an example. We have a full scale system up in, in Northern Australia and in this case, it's used, uh, foam fractionation is used as the first step because the concentrations are so high <clears throat> that we didn't want to um, send those high concentrations directly to the wastewater treatment plant, which is largely um, designed to take the PFAS concentrations down to non-detect. So in cases like that, where you have a hotspot, some really high PFAS concentrations, makes a lot of sense to put foam fractionation up front. There, there are cases where maybe there's a lot of biological treatment that needs to take place. And so having, having that biological wastewater treatment up front is going to remove some um, of the, the biodegradable compounds that might foul. It's pretty hard to foul foam fractionation, but you really don't wanna be accomplishing biological treatment in there. So that would be an example of when you would do um, 
add your foam fractionation process at the tail end as opposed to um, ahead of the biological treatment. Uh, I, there's another question is, what was the design capacity of the pilot system? I believe you were showing one in Alabama. Yes, so that is designed to treat um, anywhere from, let me think about this, um, five gallons a minute up to um, 50 gallons a minute. So pretty broad range, it all depends on the, the dwell time in, in the reactor. Okay, um, some other questions. Um, again, with regarding the pilot and full scale projects, how many do you have currently? We have um, two pilots operating currently, another one in fabrication, and I think we have five bench scale units that are used in our R&D lab, as well as um, in other labs or other um, appropriate facilities um, throughout the country. Uh, it, Steve, on the the one, the lagoon system up in Maine that you're, you're doing, how how is that actually working? You're taking the water out of the lagoon and putting it through your system? Right. Okay. So <clears throat> they recently had a, um, PFAS limit uh, imposed on the discharge from their lagoon. And so the idea with the pilot was to demonstrate that by using just foam fractionation, and this, this treatment plant takes in a lot of leachate. So it has high TDS, high iron, high TOC. And so the idea was that those phalanx, if you will, were gonna reduce the, um, the lifespan of, of the carbon and the resin in the system. So our first shot out of the gate was to pilot foam fractionation. Maybe we don't need any of those technologies, right? Just foam fractionation. <clears throat> and it worked. We were, we were able to reliably and consistently keep PFOS plus PFOA less than 70. Well, toward the end of the pilot, the main DEP came in and said, well, we're lowering, lowering the discharge standard in Maine. And although this is not, this is wastewater, not drinking water, we want this plant to achieve um, less than 20 PPT for six compounds, including one of which is a short chain compound. So we went back and looked at our data from foam fractionation and uh, foam fractionation alone is not gonna be able to get us there, right? And um, this is a plant in Maine that is going to be accepting all kinds of waste um, uh, that contain contain PFAS. It's, it's going to be sort of a catch-all. It's being funded federally and is receiving state funds. And so the Maine wants it to be sort of a flagship. They'd like to see non-detect coming out. And so it went from one of, hey, this is going to be pretty easy. We can just use foam fractionation to one of, we're going to need multiple technologies. To, uh, to, to achieve the new regs and with all the increased uh, volume of, of leachate and septage and, and other wastes, um, it's just going to be a more challenging uh, treatment matrix or, or water matrix to treat. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's yeah. why it's interesting some of these serial processes that you're lining up. Um, another question was, what final PFAS destruction do you think is, in your opinion, the, does it pair best with? Um, yeah, I, and I, I, um, <clears throat> my excitement lately is is really shifting to um, the halt process, which is hydrothermal alkaline treatment. Reason being that they've demonstrated they can mineralize PFAS convert it to fluoride ions, ions and, and, and carbon dioxide essentially, right? And the work that we've been doing with them is fairly recent. And um, to all the other technologies seem to struggle with the, uh, the real short chains, right? And in some cases we're having to demonstrate removal of, um, you know, not only four chain compounds, but also 
three carbon chain and two carbon chain T TFA. And the Hall process showed no problem, destroyed those uh, quite handily. Another technology I'm intrigued with is supercritical water oxidation, right? And not only, we don't have enough data back yet to, to know that it, it's going to be as effective at treating those short chains and the, the carboxylates in particular. But one of the nice things about a SQUO, which is supercritical water oxidation, is that it can treat uh, liquid waste, but also can treat solid waste. So it can treat spent carbon, uh, spent ion exchange resin. And so still in a, in a you know, it's not ready for prime time, prime time yet. We're, we're still working with some of these vendors to determine how well um, does SQUO, uh, is it, is, does it completely mineralize spent carbon? right, or spent resin. So a lot of this stuff, these technologies are works in progress, but, but the rate at which we're progressing and, and learning and developing toward commercialization is, is rapid. And in the next two to three years, we're gonna see a bunch of these um, destructive technologies put online, which is exciting, especially when we have entities like the military telling us, like, we don't want any PFAS waste leaving the site, right? And that really limits your options. And so now you're talking about PFAS destruction and it also heightens the importance of technologies like, like foam fractionation, right? Any technology that can take high volume, low concentration and convert it to low volume, high concentration are gonna be in, in demand moving forward. Yeah. yeah, and you're right. There's so much going on right now. It's, it's hard to keep up, but we're rooting for you, all these different technology developers. A uh, couple more questions, Steve. Uh, okay. So after any of these other destruction technologies that you're using for the foam, is there any residual material left over after that from any of these? Uh, this, does, is there anything else that needs to be managed after those that it, second step? Yes, because basically what happens is the foam concentrates at the top, and we've developed multiple innovative ways to quickly convert that foam back into a liquid, right? And then that liquid is gonna go into the destruction technology. And it's not like nothing is gonna come out, right? In most of the technologies, that liquid's gonna come out, but the PFAS is going to be mineralized, right? Or, or hope, you know, hopefully mineralized or as, as close to it as possible. And what typically is gonna happen is that's gonna be a very small, stream, you know, maybe 2% or less of the overall stream, that can then be returned back to the head of the system for another round, right? Okay. Yeah. We hope in the future we can just take and directly discharge it because there'll be no PFAS, but, but give it another go back at the head of the system. And uh, yeah, it's not like it's going to build up. These compounds are um, destructible. It's just a question of sometimes the conditions may not uh, allow one to achieve complete destruction and it might need, you know, a small fraction, you know, 0.5% may need to be returned for another um, round of treatment. All right. A couple more questions still. Um, this is a great one. Do you think the approach that you described in Maine where the water matrix is mixed is the best approach or should the different waste streams be kept separate and treated separate, you know, like landfill leachate or uh, contaminated milk or yeah if they can be kept separate i don't know do you have any well it would certainly be easier to treat separate streams for, from from one perspective because um they have different different qualities right and one might lend itself better to ion exchange one might lend itself better to carbon uh, one might be membrane treatment um, and foam fractionation might work best on, say, a landfill leachate, right? But um, it's not often practical to just put in a, a bunch of different treatment yeah. systems, right? It, it can be more practical and cost-effective to combine those streams and treat them in a single... You may have more unit processes, right? You might have carbon. You might have um, foam fractionation. You might have resin. Uh, and you might have destruction, right? 
whereas you may not need all those unit operations if you split it up into different treatment systems. So you really have to look at each, each case individually, but in a lot of cases, it makes sense to combine them together and just, and, and just pull together a train of different treatment technologies to get the job done. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's good perspective. Um, and I guess this is just a comment or a question, but it looks like we would need to treat the influent to keep PFAS out of the activated sludge. Um, yeah, that's one I haven't thought a lot about. Um, but Because when you first were describing this to me, I thought you were skimming stuff off the secondary clarifiers or something. You know, I, I didn't really realize what you were doing there, but... Yeah, so typically we would be treating, uh, if, you, if you take a wastewater treatment plant, we'd be treating the biologically treated, right, through the secondary clarifiers. Um, probably not disinfected yet, but maybe, depending, depending on the situation, right? Um, and this the foam fractionation is not going to be used to treat the sludge, right? So what do you do with with the sludge, right? Well, maybe you move that foam fractionation up front, but when you have a lot of solids and a lot of biodegradable matter, that, that may not be the best bet either. So <clears throat> it may be best to use something like foam fractionation or one of the other technologies to treat, let's, let's call this a POTW, to treat the, the, um, the, the POTW wastewater that has been treated in that plant and then to take the uh, the biosolids and run them through something like supercritical water oxidation, right? To destroy the PFAS. And then maybe you have a residual stream that could then be land applied or, or, or used um, for its, its nutrient content, right? It's um, a, a lot of different ways to do it. I certainly understand the value in removing PFAS up front because now you have a biosolids that's presumably clean and, and can be, can be uh, beneficially reused. But that's, that's honestly one that I haven't um, spent a lot of time thinking about, but is, is worthy of, uh, of consideration. It's a good question, really good. Yeah, and I'm encouraged by the questions coming in from especially superintendent level folks. Um, okay. But that's all of the questions I think we have and we are, running out of time, but this was really fascinating. And I think there may be a couple of things to hone in on for a future Lunch and Learn, maybe, Steve. Sure, um, sure. Very interesting. Great, great work you're doing. Very challenging. And like I said, we're all rooting for you and the <laughs> other and the other innovators. Um, so thank you, Steve. Thanks to everyone today for joining us. Uh, the next session is scheduled for April 22nd. It's Earth Day, and Ned Beecher and I will team up on a retrospective of the history of biosolids recycling. Should be fun. And so check out our events page for, we have these scheduled through July. And I'm always looking for suggestions. If you have them, something you'd like to lunch and learn about, let me know, I'll make it happen. So thanks again, Steve, ECT2. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you all, appreciate it.